thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we're here today with uh, Caroline from the Gift of Life, which is um, a, an organization that facilitates bone marrow um, donations. So um, Caroline, are you, I forgot to ask, right? Will you be sharing your screen today? I will not be. Okay, all right, <laughs> wonderful. So I won't, I won't go over that, but um, yeah, I'm going to turn it over to you then, Caroline, to, uh, to introduce the organization and then to introduce um, Vic and Bruce, who are donor recipient pairs. Awesome. Great. Um, thank you guys for having us on. And I, since it's a small group and, and it seems, seems pretty chill, so feel free to jump in with any questions at any time. Um, but like she said, I'm from, I'm representing Gift of Life Marrow Registry. We are a 501c3 nonprofit founded in 1991. We're celebrating our 30th anniversary this year, which is really cool. Um, we were initially founded by uh, our founder and current CEO, Jay Feinberg, who I know a lot of people in the Jewish community in this age demographic know him personally, but um, he was unfortunately diagnosed with leukemia at the age of 22. Um, at that time, there were almost no Jews in the uh, marrow registry, and a lot of the marrow matches are based on genetic background, specifically in ethnic, Jew in ethnic groups similar to um, Jewish uh, Jewish and smaller ethnic groups like that, that are um, less diverse with their HLA type because they're, they've been in a very specific part of the world. Um, so his family wasn't going to take the news lying down. His mom got um, the entire community within New Jersey and a lot of other uh, kind of did a synagogue road tour is what we call it. But she was basically going around place to place um, trying to find matches for her son within the Jewish community. They registered over 70,000 people into the bone marrow registry and that's international. They're helping everyone in the world, not just for him. Um, and he was actually able to find his miracle match, Becky Keller on the last drive that they ran. Um, so he was saved by her, her registering at one of those drives. Um, he's knock on wood, 30 years healthy and strong. I think he's 25 out from transplant, um, just cause it takes a little bit longer. And so since then he's made a, he's made an effort to grow the bone marrow registry specifically within the Jewish community. And now we're also, because we've kind of fixed that problem a little bit. Um, and now we swab everyone on birthright. We swab at almost every synagogue. We're at bar and bat mitzvah projects all the time. Um, now actually Ashkenazi Jews have a higher percentage chance of finding a match than any other ethnic group, which is really, really cool. And it's direct result of what Jay Feinberg has done, which is amazing. Um, and now we're kind of branching out into targeting other minority groups that might not have the outreach uh, similar to how the Jewish community did. Um, so that's a little bit of our tie on and why we're, we're here today. Um, and I'll answer any other questions on kind of the, the, the know-how the know and how transplants work, but I'm going to turn it over to Vic um, just to talk a little bit about his experience, why he got registered, what it was like being a donor, what it was like when you got the call that you were a match for someone, and, and just your general experience with Gift of Life. What actually happened was there was a drive, we were living in Cleveland at the time, and uh, at the JCC, and it turned out right at that same time, one of my uh, temple um, buddies from school was diagnosed with cancer. So I had never done a, a swab before. Went over to the JCC in hopes that uh, my swab would work. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't. Unfortunately, the closest match was his sister and that wasn't close enough and he passed away I, I don't remember the dates, but I would say about a year after. And um, so you stay in the registry because uh, until you, Caroline, it's 60, age 60. You, yep, 61st birthday, they take you off. <laughs> yeah. So um, I was a whole lot younger then. And um, one day I get a call from the organization saying that I'm a potential match for somebody. Uh, and would I be interested in pursuing the opportunity? And they, uh, that's the first question. Once you say yes, then they, they go in much more detail, send you information, knowing that there is no guarantee that you match uh, the potential recipient. So what happened is they started me locally in Cleveland going to, um, I don't remember which company, but one of the diagnostic companies they did blood tests. Um, when that came back and they found out that everything was good, um, I had a couple more tests. And then 
they uh, sent me to a doctor to get checked out, make sure I didn't have any um, illnesses or any uh, um, medicines or anything that would be counterproductive. And I had options where to go. I ended up going to the University of Maryland. Um, I don't remember. I think it's on the waterfront. I'm not sure exactly what the name is there. And this is uh, you know, a long time ago. And I went up, doctor tested me, and uh, they came back about a week or two later and said, everything looks good. Let's see where it goes. And before you know it, um, I'm being asked to start on some special medicine that I, the nurse came out to my house, injected me um, to get the cells moving and get the, uh, um, the stem cells specifically and uh, moving. And then once that was happening over the five days, they had already um, planned the transfer. Now, during all of this, I didn't know Bruce. I had no idea who it was going to. It was just um, a, a male, probably close to my age, 57 at the time. Um, but that's all I knew. And uh, so I was uh, taken and Sue, Sue came with me. We flew to uh, Maryland, University of Maryland. And we did uh, during the day what's called an apheresis. Basically... If you know anybody that's having uh, kidney uh, problems, they have to clean the system. Mine was a bit different. They put the blood through the machine. It took out the stem cells and it put the blood back in me through my uh, other arm. Uh, that went on for about four and a half hours. I was in a hospital bed watching television and that was it. And the next thing I know, um, they told me, even before I was unhooked, that the, uh, the cells were gone. That's all I knew. And um, they uh, had me stay overnight, had me eat steak because I needed the iron and I wasn't gonna fight them eating steak. And um, that was it um, for, for that portion. So that's, that's what happened to me. Uh, Caroline, you wanna turn it over to Bruce for his story or do you wanna take over? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Just before we get into that, because I know it's kind of confusing if you haven't had a personal experience with it, but um, when you are registered in the registry, everything's anonymized. So the only thing that the um, donor knows is the age of the person and their diagnosis. So it'll say you've matched with a 43-year-old woman with AML or multiple myeloma or something like that. Um, and so that's why it, it is kind of anonymous. And I believe on the recipient end, they don't, they don't know anything about their donor. They just know that they're, they're donating the cells. Um, so it's completely anonymized, which is crazy because the hospital literally takes the bag out of the apheresis machine, runs it either halfway across the world or just down the hall to the BMT unit. So um, Bruce, do you want to talk a little bit about your experience sure. from the recipient side? All right. I'll go back a little bit before uh, my last diagnosed. I was diagnosed with uh, acute myeloid leukemia uh, nearly 27 years ago. And um, I, uh, I underwent various, I obtained various opinions as to what I should do from some of the larger cancer centers on the uh, East Coast. And at that point, a transplant was an option. Chemo was also an option. And um, I, uh, after hearing the experts' opinions, I elected to um, go the chemo route and um, I did that. I was, um, uh, I had chemo over a period of, of six months and um, I walked around with a mask for the next six months. So I was all use, I was all ready for the pandemic. Um, and uh, everything went fine. I was well for, 15 years and um, one day I wasn't feeling well and I recall that when I was originally diagnosed with cancer it felt like I was getting the flu but I just, something just didn't seem right and um, I went to my oncologist and I was diagnosed with something called myelodysplasia 
which is related to leukemia, was probably the effect of the chemo that I had. But um, I had been treated in a hospital in northern New Jersey. Um, I was told that all, at this point I, um, I, I needed to have a transplant and they did not do it at that facility. So I got a couple other opinions, fewer this time because there were really relatively few places that were doing transplants, even in the New York area. Um, and um, I uh, ended up selecting a doctor at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in Manhattan. And um, uh, I went through a protocol that they utilized, which was a little different than the protocol utilized in other places, but it seemed to fit me. I won't bore you with the details. So um, they then uh, went out and they searched the registries to try to locate a donor for me. Uh, I have one sibling and she did not match. Um, so it, it had to be an unrelated donor. And uh, one day they advised me that I had six potential matches, but only one perfect match. Uh, you, uh, Caroline, maybe you could just explain this better than I, but you, you, there are various sites where you can match. And the more sites you match on, the, ch the better the chances are, are of surviving a transplant. And I had one ideal, and um, that is Vic. <laughs> and um, I ended up going into the hospital. Uh, they told me that I would have to stay a month and that my visitors would be limited. And uh, I couldn't leave the room. And uh, that turned out to be correct. I was there about three weeks and they told me that today is the day. And uh, I, I, I said, um, can you give me the information as to you know, where my donor is? And they would tell me, because I knew they couldn't identify him. They uh, told me he's an American and that, that's as much information as they were going to give me. And they said that they were prohibited by law from, uh, uh, identifying him if he wanted to be identified um, for a period of a year. And I'm told that um, donors often don't want to be identified because they don't know whether the donee is going to make it. And um, so uh, I, one day anyway, they came in and they had a little bag and they had a physician's assistant who put it into my vein. 15 minutes I was done <laughs> and uh, it was the it was actually relatively anticlimactic um, it was just like getting a blood transfusion which I had gotten many of as from the time I was diagnosed to the time that I had the transplant um, I was in the hospital for about another two weeks after that um, and then I was uh, permitted to go home uh, I had another long period of time wearing a mask out, um, and then I returned to work, and uh, I've been feeling great since then, and um, Vic and I uh, exchanged letters, uh, several letters during that first year. They were all anonymous letters, and uh, what we found out that we had things in common, we're about the same age. We both had a couple of kids that were the same age. Uh, we were both Ashkenazi Jews. And um, I don't think I knew where he was, other than I think you may have told me you weren't from the New York area. And, um, and the gift of life, I found out that, his, that the transplant was uh, somewhat, somehow engineered through the gift of life. Um, uh, I, I really didn't know very much about the gift of life, um, though I will say as an aside, um, I, I used to work in a town called Roseland, New Jersey, which is um, outside of Newark, about 25 miles west of Manhattan. And there was a little office in my building and I didn't know what they were doing, but they were, other than they were raising money in some way. And it turned out to be, uh, 
Jay's building. I guess it was the genesis of, of his organization. I think he grew up in uh, an adjoining town um, to where my office was. So, so we never met. Um, I read about the organization later and seemed like it was a very noble purpose. And I've turned out, it's, it's turned out that uh, I now believe it is a tremendous organization that does so much good that filled the gap that needed to be filled. And uh, glad to hear they're venturing outside the Jewish community right now and that the needs of the Jewish community were met. So, um, Fast forward about it to the year after I was, uh, I guess, around, I was diagnosed and Gift of Light had a, an annual event in Manhattan. I, it was their big fundraising event, I believe. And at that time, they introduced for the first time um, uh, stem cell uh, donors and their donees. And they were brought up on stage. So uh, they started the affair. I was sitting in the audience. Victor was sitting in the audience. I looked around to see who he might be, but I had no idea. By the way, there were 700 people there that night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we assigned a staff person to make sure you guys stay oh, apart that during that this, too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we like the drama. Well, it worked. Yeah, it worked. And we were brought up on stage and we hugged and it was a very, very emotional moment. And since then, we have remained close friends, notwithstanding uh, the fact that I live in North Jersey and Vic has lived in Cleveland and now Cincinnati. Uh, we have visited each other when Vic was still working and came to this area. We would always have a meal together and my wife and his wife. I think they play uh, Scrabble online together, <laughs> and um, we, um, we've been out to their place, they've been to ours, I was at their son's wedding, they were at my daughter's wedding, and that's been a wonderful uh, friendship, and uh, I, if, we have a uh, gift of life to, uh, to thank for all of that. If memory serves me correct, uh, it's 10 years ago. April, I think right about now, when we met, I believe it was that 2000. Sounds about right. Because, yeah, uh, 2010. Yeah. 2011. Uh, yeah, well, it might be. It was 2008. 11. I think it was Wait, 11. On I'm not home, so I can't look this stuff up. But it's, I believe this is our 10th tenth, tenth year. You can see of this something. probably, but this says, I'm sure you can, because I can't see it on my screen, but it's uh, a. <laughs> It says Gift of Life Bone Marrow Foundation Partners for Life, May 12th, 2011, Bruce Wasatsky and Vic Amster. I keep it in my home office. <laughs> so uh, we, we know for a fact, Vic, that it was uh, 10 years ago next week. Yep. Wow. Time yeah. passes quickly. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so uh, it, Bruce is right. I mean, we we stayed close, and not everybody gets this opportunity to really become friends with uh, their donor or recipient, vice you know, vice versa, however it is. So uh, I'm very fortunate that, that Bruce wanted to meet me, and when I got the phone call, did I want to meet him? Uh, there was no hesitation. It was just like absolutely, let's let's do it. So mm -hmm. it's uh, it's been been a an amazing 10 years for uh, both of our families. And just as an aside, uh, in terms of the uh, gift of life and it's, it's uh, initially centering on the Jewish community, I have a very close friend that I went to law school with who's a Japanese American. And he contracted an illness that um, he needed a bone marrow transplant. And he couldn't find one in any of the registries uh, for a long time. And he went, he finally found a, a match in China and a match in Tokyo. And the, the match in China decided that they didn't want to go ahead with it. The match initial, as soon as they were contacted, the match in Japan initially did, but there apparently is something in the, in the Japanese culture that, 
frowns in some way upon this, and she ended up um, not agreeing to be uh, a, his donor, and unfortunately, he passed away. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of work to be done in other communities out there. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so sorry to hear that. Um, but that, I mean, unfortunately, that's a story that we hear with the patients that we work with. And, and every day I sit in the office and you hear people making phone calls and, yeah. and people don't, for whatever reason, um, either can't or don't want to donate. And one of the main things that we also try to focus on is when we do this outreach to the community in events like this, kind of taking down a lot of the myths that surround bone marrow transplants. Um, so that's a huge hurdle that we have in general. One, everyone has an association from like every TV or movie that shows a bone marrow transplant. It's this giant needle and you're yeah. completely conscious and da, 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 da. And it's a really, really uh, awful, horrible procedure. That's not the way that it is. That's totally a fabrication of Hollywood. Um, we're actually at the point now where about 90% of transplants are the apheresis procedure that Vic described. So if you've ever given platelets or plasma, same thing, except you get those neupogen shots before that boost the white blood cell count so they can take it out. The 10% that isn't stem cell um, is actual bone marrow that they take from your hip. It's a 30 minute procedure. You're completely knocked out for it. Um, most people leave the hospital the day of it's, you know, they stay in a hotel the next night. Um, not that it's not to minimize it in any way. It's still an amazing, amazing thing that people go through, um, just for a perfect stranger, but there, it's a lot easier to go through the physical donation process than a lot of people think. And it, a lot of people don't even want to hear about it because it, it freaks them out a lot. Um, so that's a big thing that we kind of battle with when we're trying to get people who are already swabbed in the registry to go through and donate. Um, so one of the things that we introduced that's a little different than other registries, we actually have our donors rank themselves one to five how likely they would be to donate. Um, so that means when we get those matches, we have a little bit more of a sense, all right, this person said they were a two in likeliness to donate. They've been in the registry for six months. We're going to give them a call, see how they feel. Um, because, you know, we've kind of decided as a team, we want everyone to have the opportunity to donate, but it's a lot more difficult for a patient to hear is the feedback we got that they have a match that won't donate than just, you know, we still got to find a match for you. So, um, I, it's, an, an unfortunate problem, but it's important. So I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> so Carolyn, what percentage of the people that say initially they're going to donate and when they're called upon to donate say no? I'm not sure what the overall percentage is. Um, one of the big things that we also kind of battle is so the, the ideal donor is between 18 and 35 years old. So a lot of the people that get registered are registering on a college campus, they're registering on birthright, they're registering in these scenarios when they're a little bit younger. Um, and a lot of people don't think about it, which is great because we, we grab a lot of 18 year olds that see a free donut and register at the bone marrow, you know, walking through the quad, um, as crazy as that sounds. But we also get a lot of people that say, oh my God, I didn't know what I was signing up for. My friend just told me to do it. So um, fortunately, you know, we've over, and even in the last like, eight years that I've been involved with Gift of Life, that number of people not donating has gone down and down because we're trying to make sure everyone has the correct information when they're signing up so we don't have to deal with that later on down the road. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, and I think we can open up to questions now if anyone has any. I'm, yeah, I, and then I can tell you a little bit more about what we're doing at Gift of Life now, just kind of wrap it up. Why don't you, are you going to say something about the new uh, center down in Boca Raton? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, we're, was... so, so we're based in Boca Raton. Um, something that's really unique about Gift of Life is, uh, so we keep mentioning all these other registries. There's about 180 bone marrow registries across the world. They all feed into an international database. Um, so they're, they're not duplicating work, um, but they're all different foundations that do that. Gift of Life is unique in a lot of ways. Um, we're the first people to use swabs to get cheek cells instead of using blood draws to register people. Um, we were also the first people to register people online pre-screen with medical history forms. And now we actually have an in-house donation center at our headquarters in Boca Raton, um, which is really something that they've been working on for years, getting the funding for and making it up and running because Vic, it sounds like you had a pretty good experience, but some of the hospitals that our donors go to are 
dingy. It's not a very nice unit. The person next to them is getting chemo or dialysis. The nurses are a little overworked. Um, so to kind of make sure that our donors that are doing such an amazing heroic act to make sure they get the best treatment possible, we fly them down to Boca Raton. We put them in a beautiful hotel on the beach. Um, we get them a car service. They come straight to our office. The, uh, the donation pods in our Gift of Life Collection Center are like, we have a TV, we have gaming systems, we have a nurse dedicated just to that one donor. So if we have seven people going at once, we have seven nurses on call doing one donor at a time. Um, so we've, we've really kind of beefed that up to make sure that our donors are getting the absolute premier experience they can. Um, and then we've also started a biobank um, and cell repository. So the goal for that is we've identified a thousand people in our registry that are super matches. So they have uh, genetic markers that make them more likely to be a match for someone. And we're hoping that we can get them to donate ahead of time, freeze their cells. So when someone like Bruce's doctor says, you need a transplant, you don't have to worry about, is this person gonna donate it? Are they gonna, you know, is something gonna come up last minute and they don't make it to that donation day? Those cells are already in our freezer. We just ship them out in a courier and they go straight to the okay. hospital. That's great. So uh, and the facility uh, is spectacular. Is. Sue and I went down, we were in, in Boca Raton. My uh, friend and his wife lived down there and we went over to the new facility and I had been at the old one too, but this thing is unbelievable. And uh, I, I can't say enough about it. It's just gorgeous. And all the people there are, day in day out there to save lives i mean it's i don't know what else to say you know it's it's nice so um what i'd like to interject here also is that all of us on the call except for rabbi chapra are over the age of donation but um my comment would be to have your grandchildren your children, maybe, if they've never donated, because if they have, they're in a registry. But if they haven't donated, um, they can call me. I'm sure they can call Caroline. She'd be happy, you know. But I can tell them how, how painless it is to do the initial swab. Oh, yeah. And then later on, you, you know, God willing, you get called. Um, then, then you make the decision, like, like she mentioned before. But... Um, they, you know, they need more Then obviously the more people that do it, the more the odds are that someone will match. And at the temple in Cleveland, where we were, our, our police officer who was doing security, he did it. The custodial staff, they're black. They did it. We didn't care. We wanted, we wanted the more opportunities that we could. So, um, they should do it. And again, it's painless. I know uh, Hillel at UC is involved in that. I wanted to do a drive at the synagogue and um, Sonia uh, had mentioned that uh, she was something with Hillel and that she knew that they were doing that. So uh, no reason for us to do anything. We deferred back to them. We did one at Ohio State yeah, too. So did one. Bruce and I went out to... Uh, a camp. Do you remember where that was, Bruce? In Pennsylvania, we went out to a camp to uh, for a drive to swab uh, the counselors. Right. Yeah. I so went was out there to too. a couple yeah. other yeah. camps, and I've been to uh, a few drives to help out. And uh, there are walks up here that I go on every year pre-COVID that uh, that is sponsored, and it's just a wonderful organization. Yeah. I, I, my, I, I didn't have to ask my kids. Um, my kids um, uh, both were swabbed as soon as it happened to me, and one of my daughters helped with uh, with an or with a swab at an event at her college that I think ended up getting at least a hundred people in the registry. So that's great. That's awesome. Uh, um, I asked Bruce to name it, have his first grandson named after me. They didn't do it. They didn't do it. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's going to be it's my third What'd you, you say? Can't do it, Vic. It's against the Jewish tradition. Okay, thank you, Bruce. As long as you're, <laughs> as long as you're kicking, I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, keep saying that. It's, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, in the in the Sephardic tradition, they do name people after they do living That's members. True. Right. Yeah, all right. Well, uh, Vic 
Eric and I don't qualify. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Elaine, did you have a question? I saw Rabbi maybe post that or? Well, I was just going to say that um, it, our daughter's a cantor in Louisville, Kentucky, and she has a congregation much like ours where a lot of the people are above 60, but they also have a preschool in the building and things like that. Now, how would I get information to her about maybe doing this at her synagogue or in Louisville, Kentucky? Yeah, so that's awesome question. Um, two things. One, we anytime anyone wants to run a swab drive, if they're doing, you know, if they're swabbing two people or they're swabbing three thousand people, we will make it happen. Um, because even if those people, like you guys, maybe can't swab or are already in the registry, that's another point that we can tell you how important this is. Um, so we love any kind of drive. Um, couple things. So we have an army of volunteers all over the country that can help set up can actually run the swab table for you. Um, we can also do virtual training and send you the supplies and then have a staff member like myself on hand for it, just to make sure if you have any questions, you can text or email us really quickly. Um, so we do train lay leaders to, to run those drives for us. Um, we also have about 300 college campus ambassadors that are all over the country. I would be shocked if there wasn't one in Louisville. I don't know, maybe with, with COVID, it might be a little different now, but um, we will send them wherever we can get swabs because we've trained them up. They swab, their goal is to swab a thousand people a year on campus. Um, so they, they're really good at it and they can, they can set up and take care of everything for you. Um, so if you want to, I'll drop my email in the chat after this and you can shoot me an email with all of that info and I can, I can get you to the right people to make sure we get those kits there. Okay. Thank you. I and have a, the, a, a yeah. similar, a different question uh, that, we are all over 70, so we can't over donate, un unfortunately. Over 60. Over 60. Um, but if we were swabbed, would that count as, as at least an indicator as to whether yeah. our children might be matches? No. So that's another big misconception with the registry. Um, you actually just across the board, genetically, you only have a 33% chance of matching with a sibling. Um, so it actually is less based on your family and more based on your ethnic background and your HLA type, um, which is a really weird distinction. So even if you have, you know, seven siblings and 50 first cousins, they might not be a match for you. They probably won't be, but someone at your synagogue likely could be just because of the genetic background. Um, so it's a very weird specific thing. Blood type also is no indicator. Um, hmm. So I don't know, Vic and Bruce, I Bruce, did your blood type change after your transplant? Do you know? Uh, you know, I, that was never mentioned to me, so okay. I still know. But so I, know, some, I, knew it, I know it can. Yeah. Some yeah. people we know it didn't work you know. to grow hair, though. <laughs> no, it did not help with hair at all. Work and hair did not come back. And he still can't do magic. Can't do magic. <laughs> <laughs> so... So yeah, it um so your swabs wouldn't be and because it's anonymized, you you don't really you don't ever see your HLA type. Um you can get it requested at a doctor, you can get a workup for it, but you it wouldn't be an indicator. Um but you can if you have nieces, nephews, kids, grandkids that want to register, anyone under the age of 40, 40, um, if they go to giftoflife.org slash swab, they can order a kit for free. Um but something that we have a lot of people also do is our swab kits cost $60 to process. That's from when we get the kits, when we put them through the lab, when we're storing them, um, anything that has to do with getting someone in a profile in the registry costs $60. Um, so a lot of times people will say, I'm already in the registry or I'm too old or I have a health issue, but I would like to sponsor my friend, grandchild, sister, brother, whatever who can. Um, and we actually, the, the walk that Bruce mentioned, we do our Steps for Life 5K in a couple different cities. We're having it virtual this year, which is um, a, a blessing and a curse. The good thing is, is people from all over the country get to participate. Um, but obviously everyone wants to be in person after a year of the pandemic. But the cool thing about that event is 100% of the proceeds go towards processing swab kits. Nothing goes to overhead, nothing goes to fundraising costs. If we raise $60,000, that's 10, or that's a thousand kids into the registry that we're paying directly for them. Um, and it's earmarked within our organization for that. So people really like that event. Um, it's going on right now. I can, I can drop the link to that as well. We have a couple synagogues that have formed teams for it um, and are using, you know, this kind of situation to 
to get people acquainted with gift of life and then, and then being able to do our, our virtual event. So, yeah. You are both uh, Ashkenazic and Sephardic Jews, different. And yes. You, you, I assume you've been dealing with both groups or. So we initially started with, um, hang on one second. I just wanted to, so we initially started with Ashkenazi just because Jay's Ashkenazi. Um, we've kind of branched into the other, the other groups within the Jewish community. Um, we still have a very, uh, Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews have a much lower percentage chance of finding a match. Um, and a lot of that has to do with not having as many of them in the U.S. Um, and so they're kind of a little more spread out. Um, the Israeli donor database has a few more people that are from those backgrounds, but then there's some interesting mixes going on there. So um, the problem is, is we only work within the U.S. for finding donors. Um, we'll give transplants to anyone who needs them wherever they are in the world, but our donors are all in the U.S. So um, even if we access 100% of those communities, it's not quite enough to make a dent universally. Um, but we do work with both of, we, we work with other communities within the Jewish community um, or other groups within the Jewish community. We actually had um, a young man, Adam Kreef out in LA, which you guys may have seen. He's, um, he was, I believe half Sephardic um, and he had a difficult time finding a match. So his family started an entire campaign. They swapped like hundreds of thousands of people trying to find his match. Um, they got Kim Kardashian involved. They had all of these celebrities involved raising awareness. It was a, a huge push. We got a lot of people in those communities that we hadn't been able to access before. Um, he, unfortunately, similar to the story Bruce said, he had a, a match in Germany, um, finally, who he had a partial match from one of the drives he ran that wasn't uh, his first choice. And then he had a full match in Germany that didn't want to go through with the transplant, unfortunately. Um, so he went with the partial match and and it, it didn't work out for him, but his family's made a huge impact in us being able to access the Mizrahi and Sephardic communities. Good. Can you tell me what the, what the lowest age of someone who can donate is again? I didn't catch that. It is 18. 18, um, yep. 18 to 60? 18 to 60, yep. Okay. Does the gift of life give... Um, like, does it work with insurance to help people who are um, recipients and or donors? Sorry, I'm muted. Um, <laughs> my my dog is passed out in the corner and kind of snoring right now. So <laughs> she's she's a greyhound. She acts like a horse. Um, she uh, so we a hundred percent of any expense ever for the donor is one hundred percent covered from the medical procedure to your Uber to the hotel, your Uber to the airport, your flight, everything, all of your meals, we cover 100% of that. Um, on the recipient end, we have at certain times worked specifically with recipients to help them with some of those things. Um, but in general, we work on the donor side. Um, so we don't, we don't really know the recipients that well because they're working with their team at a hospital. Mm. So. It almost seems that for insurance coverage that and maybe another source is the recipient's carrier should contribute to the, the donor's expense. I'm sure they wouldn't feel that way, but it's uh, <laughs> somewhat logical to me that, you know, uh, if they're curing a medical condition that... Yeah, so... Uh, so the um, Be the Match, which is actually the National Merit Donor Program in the U.S., they receive government funding to help kind of offset some of those costs. Gift of Life's 100% funded by our donors. Um, so we have or our monetary donors. So we don't receive any of those kind of insurance or any. We don't we don't get any of those benefits. <laughs> so, yeah. But the great thing with that is, is we can kind of use our money more how we want to. So building the collection center and making sure our donors are staying in nice hotels and that they don't have to take five different flights just to get there and all of that good stuff. Um, yeah. we, we take pride in that. And that's something that, you know, it's, it's hit or miss. It's, do you take the money or do you not? And we, we've had really good success with, we have a lot of amazing monetary donors over the years who have been able to kind of empower us to make that experience a little bit better. Okay. Awesome. Any other questions? Um, I think, that, so this is something that um, Valerie, who's the other um, 
uh, employee with gift yes. of life we talked about was, um, you know, we've talked about within this within this meeting that, um, you know, you can't be a donor when you're over 60, but you can most definitely be a recipient if you're over 60. And can you talk about how gift of life helps with the recipients? Like, I guess I'm asking, like, if you are, if you're swabbed and you're registered with gift of life, does that help your chances of finding a donor? No. It doesn't, unfortunately. So what basically happens is when someone like Bruce needs a transplant, his team, his oncology team will go into the international database. They will see a list of profiles that say, you know, this is partial match one, this is partial match two, this is perfect match three. It'll tell the doctor their age, um, their gender, and what uh, registry they're in. And so then when he knows it's from Gift of Life, the doctor will then, from the transplant center, will then contact Gift of Life and say, we have this person that came up as a hit on your match. Gift of Life will do the end of dealing with the donor and making sure they're all in. Um, and then they'll communicate with the transplant center and then it will come to the patient. Um, so when we really deal with recipients, it's usually, unfortunately, someone who doesn't have a full match um, or doesn't have any matches, which is also very common. Um, and we'll, you know, they'll, we'll get social media campaigns going for them. We'll get, we'll get, you know, more targeted to their ethnic background. Um, and we'll kind of help them find donors that we think would be likely to be their match. Um, but we don't, yeah, then our staff, a separate part of our staff will then contact with the transplant center. So there's, because of HIPAA and everything, there's just that kind of extra, layer of anonymity and that extra middleman. Yeah. So I put my um, email in the chat and then Rabbi has all of the contact info for Gift of Life as well. So feel free to reach out to us if it's just a follow-up question or anything else. We're always, we're always happy to talk to you guys. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Caroline, for being here. And Bruce and Vic, thank you for being here too and sharing oh, your pleasure. story. Sure. Nice to meet you. Yasha Koa, Victor. Carolyn, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much. This was so inspiring. I hope a lot of people watch it.